Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl, and I'm in the Education Department here at the Museum of Nebraska History. I would like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series, which is held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society's Foundation for the funding of these lectures. The Foundation's financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Today's speaker is Tom Beaker, curator of the Nebraska State Historical Society's Fort Robinson Museum. Tom has been here several times to present programs. His topic today is Army Posts on the Northern Plains 1864 to 1948. Please welcome Tom Beaker. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'll have a few prepared comments and then afterwards we'll have time for some questions. Uh, but I'm going to uh, be talking about Nebraska forts, but it sort of got interesting to me about some of these places that happen to stay around longer than they intended. So that's how we get the uh, forts through three wars and a few more. Today we will be looking at some longtime army posts on the Northern Plains region, which is Nebraska, the Dakotas, Montana, and Wyoming. During the 19th century, nearly four, uh, 70 forts were established there. Of this number, a select few saw decades of continuous military occupation. Although a fort could have been utilized through three or more wars, it was a virtual impossibility for a soldier to have participated in the Plains Indian Wars, World War I, and then World War II. However, we did have a few career army men that came pretty close. Charles King served as a young enlisted man in the Civil War before graduating from West Point. He commanded a brigade and saw action in the Philippine insurrection and trained troops for the First World War. When King finally retired from the military in 1931, he was credited with 70 years of military service. Another longtime soldier was Hugh Scott. Scott graduated entered West Point in 1871 and by 1914 was the Army's chief of staff. He also served as an interim Secretary of War. Our local favorite, however, is Guy V. Henry, Jr., the first recorded birth at Fort Robinson in January of 1875. After graduating from West Point in 1898, he had a distinguished Army career, retiring as a Major General in 1936. Henry was called back to active duty in 1941 and served throughout World War II and beyond. His service time totaled well over 50 years. Although men could not have served continuously from the 1860s through World War II, forts could. Although their military missions had changed with age, the last old fort served well, and today several of them are still active military installations. The Army Post was the soldier's home where he lived, trained, relaxed, and passed time until the Army called him into harm's way. It was also an important local institution for economic benefits, civilian employment, and a symbol of local pride. Improvements came with age as more modern facilities replaced the crude structures of the early years. After years of continual use, Army posts grew in size, housing thousands of men. Now the small object that you see in the upper right represents the parade ground area of Fort Sisseton, South Dakota, a two-company post of the 1870s. The rest of the page represents in the same scale the 1910 layout of Fort Riley, Kansas. Several Army posts in the western half of the United States were occupied before the Civil War and through World War II. 
For example, on the West Coast, the Presidio at San Francisco was active from 1847 until the 1990s. In the Midwest, Fort, Sis or Fort Snelling, Minnesota, was garrisoned from 1819 to 1946. Interestingly, two forts in neighboring Kansas were built before the Civil War and are still active Army posts. Fort Riley, established in 1853, today houses the 1st Infantry Division. And Fort Leavenworth, built in 1827, is the Army Command and General Staff College. Leavenworth is the oldest continuously active Army post west of the Mississippi River. The first permanent Army presence on the Northern Plains came with Fort Atkinson in 1820 on the eastern edge of Nebraska. At the time it was abandoned in 1827, Atkinson was the largest single post in the United States. Twenty years later, the Army returned to the Plains, and between 1848 and 1898, 66 different forts were built there. The first forts were built on lines of transportation, while Forts Kearney in Nebraska and Laramie in Wyoming guarded the Oregon Trail, Fort Randall, South Dakota, was established in 1856, the first of a string of posts that sprang up along the Missouri River. During the Civil War, additional posts were built along the Overland Route, along with a whole raft of subposts that protected scattered stage and telegraph stations. Some of these early posts were temporary affairs, abandoned after the need passed. However, others were occupied for decades. <laughs> after the Civil War, the Army was in two places, on reconstruction duty in the South and in the West. Western duty for the Army was protecting whites passing through or settling in the domain of the Plains Indian. Construction of trans the Transcontinental Railroad was a major priority, and new posts such as Sydney Barracks, Omaha Barracks, and Forts David A. Russell and Sanders in Wyoming quickly sprang up. A line of forts along the railroad meant rapid troop deployment and facilitated supply. Other posts were established to guard Indian agencies, reservations, and settlements. Longtime Army posts like Forts Robinson, Missoula and Montana, and Meade in the Black Hills were created for that purpose. The Great Sioux War of 1876 and 77 saw the confinement of the Plains tribesmen to the reservations and new forts were built. By 1880, there were nearly 40 forts on the Northern Plains. The majority were small two or three company posts. It must be remembered from 1870 until the Spanish-American War, the Army was very small, 25,000 men in total, and that's the entire United States Army. At that time, in the Department of the Platte, which consisted of Nebraska, Wyoming, and part of Utah, there was only one soldier for every 110 square miles. The decades of the 1880s was one of major consolidation of Army posts in the West. The Plains Indians were defeated and confined to reservations. Expanding railroad routes facilitated consolidation. Forts were located on, forts located on railroads grew, while those in isolated and difficult to supply points were abandoned. The survivor posts housed eight to 10 companies of troops. The Army did not want to abandon the Northern Plains, but just retrench. Because Fort Laramie, that great icon of the Army in the West, was not located on the railroad, it was closed in 1890. The end of the Indian Wars also brought a need for new posts, not located on the frontier, but near metropolitan areas. Because of labor and rest in the late 1880s and 1890s, the Army became a domestic police force. Because of fear of strikes, anarchy, and other civil unrest, large forts were built at places like Chicago and Denver. In 1891, Fort Crook was established south of Omaha. This was the last Army post that was built in Nebraska. In 
For the first time, the traditional role in the Army in the West had changed. After their protective roles were over, economic factors kept some Indian Wars posts open. Decisions for maintaining garrisons on the Northern Plains became political rather than strategic in nature. Additionally, after the introduction of standard designed permanent buildings, usually made of brick by local, politi local politicians, partitioned the War Department to build such improvements at their forts. The handsome brick quarters and barracks surviving today symbolize the continuation of the military presence long after the local danger had passed. However, during the 1890s, fear of outbreak weighed heavily on Westerners who vividly remember, remembered the 1890 Ghost Dance Rebellion. Such fears became points of argument for retention or building new posts. In fact, as late as 1906, troops had been sent out against the Utes who had left their reservation in Utah. Western editors stressed the continued for a need for continued military protection even when there was no local danger. As a result, the 1890s saw several new forts built, including Fort McKenzie in Wyoming, Fort Lincoln, North Dakota, and Fort Harrison, Montana. The new posts were large modern facilities for housing troops, but could also be, also be seen as political boondoggles. Rebuilding and improvement also came for useful older forts, including Forts Meade and Robinson. By 1898, 12 Army posts were still occupied on the Northern Plains. Three posts were in Nebraska, four in Montana, three in Wyoming, and one each in South and North Dakota. The declaration of war with Spain brought a rude awakening to the Army General Staff. The Army, small as it was, was still scattered across the Western Plains and had to be moved to mobilization centers for overseas deployment. Forts in the zone of the interior were stripped of troops, leaving small detachments to guard empty facilities. Almost immediately after the Spanish War, the Philippine insurrection broke out and troops were sent there. With the Army faced with new responsibilities overseas, soldiers could not be re returned quickly to the Northern Plains. The total lack of preparation for the new wars brought a change for stateside Army distribution. The Army no longer could think in terms of battalion or regimental sized operations. The new Global Army brought needs for training and consolidation into brigades and division sized concentrations. Additionally, Funds for improvements or expansion of Northern Plains forts now had to compete with projects in overseas possessions and stateside coastal fortifications. The general staff recommended only to station troops in large, centrally located posts, not in the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana or along the Niobrara River. Certain posts in isolated sections or without permanent buildings such as Fort Niobrara near Valentine, for example, were lap go. However, troops could be garrisoned at stations with newer standardized facilities. This inspired politicians near the diminishing number of forts to campaign for construction and improvements. A half a million dollars was spent for new buildings at Fort Missoula, 600,000 at Fort Robinson, the big winner, however, was Fort David A. Russell, championed by longtime Wyoming Senator, and this is important, and also the Chairman of the Military Affairs Committee, Francis E. Warren, where nearly $5 million was expended to expand it to a brigade sized post. New problems arose in 1911. The United States government became concerned about internal affairs in Mexico and saw a need for increased protection along its southern border. Gradually, troops were, troops were siphoned off the northern plains. After Pancho Villa invaded Columbus, New Mexico in 1916, numbers further plummeted. In 
By 1917, 26 men manned Fort Meade, South Dakota. 16 men were left at Fort Robinson, and only two officers and 36 men remained at Fort Russell. America's involvement with the Great War came the next year. A massive, well-trained and equipped military force was immediately needed, and the, older, uh, the old northern forts were largely passed by. By 1917, most were vacant of regular troops that had already departed to the Mexican border or to other stations. By April of that year, a total of 589 soldiers remained at only eight posts in the whole five-state region. The largest single garrison at the time was Fort Yellowstone, which housed two-thirds of that number. <coughs> Troops had been stationed at Yellowstone Park since 1886 to protect it from vandals and game poachers. With the creation of the National Park Service in 1916, the Army was apparently no longer needed at Yellowstone Park, and Fort Yellowstone was abandoned. Unfortunately, Congress failed to pass an appropriation to support Park Service guardianship, and the troops had to remove or return early the next year. From then until October 1918, a 7th Cavalry Squadron again protected the park. The Army decided that training posts were needed in milder, more populated areas to facilitate mobilization and supply. The northern posts were just too isolated to fit into any large-scale training scheme. To the south, Fort Riley did fit the bill, and huge temporary cantonments were constructed there to train a full division. That's where your dad was, Dorothy. <coughs> Just before the outbreak of the war, the surviving northern posts did see a use for state-level National Guard organization and mobilization, and in fact, Fort Russell, with its extensive excellent facilities, was used to form several new cavalry regiments and for artillery training. During the war, several northern forts were again used for Army schools. The University of Montana conducted a school for motor vehicle maintenance at Fort Missoula. Fort Omaha, originally established in 1868 to house troops protecting the Union Pacific Railroad, became the first balloon school in the United States military history. Scores of balloon companies were organized there and trained with a variety of balloons and also experimented with parachute jumping. I don't know about that. Almost every American balloon observer that served on the Western Front trained at Fort Omaha. After the war, Fort Russell became a uh, demobilization center where some 35,000 soldiers were processed out of the Army. The end of hostilities saw another use for the old forts. With many thousands of battle casualties returning to the states for convalescent recovery, there just were not enough hospital beds. Across the United States, forts no longer needed for military purposes were turned over to the Veterans Bureau and quickly converted for hospital pr uh, purposes. By 1921, Forts Harrison and McKenzie both became veterans hospitals. In 1930, the U.S. Veterans Bureau, the Bureau of Pensions, and the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers were consolidated to form the more familiar Veterans Administration. In the 1920s, both new and more familiar uses came for the northern forts. In addition to Forts Harrison and McKenzie, Fort Robinson was virtually abandoned as a troop station during the war, but gained new life as a quartermaster remount depot. With its new mission, Horses and mules were received, processed, and conditioned there, and then issued to the mounted troops, uh, mounted services, the cavalry, transportation corps, and field artillery. In 1924, remount operations at Fort Keogh, Montana, was established in 1876, were moved to the new depot. 
historic old Fort Robinson, one of the most noted outposts of the Indian Wars, became in fact a government horse farm. Its, use, its continued use was guaranteed by an advantageous location on two railroads. By this time, the stationing of troops on the northern plains was actually uh, an anarchism. The army now had global responsibilities, not domestic ones. And with the need for rapid deployment, keeping manpower at the old Indian Wars forts was not necessary. It was truly a different world than the one that young lieutenants King, Scott, and Henry rode into a decade earlier. But as in times past, the local populations were dependent on the economic uh, benefits of having large numbers of soldiers stationed nearby. The dangers of old were clearly gone, but the residents in Fort Towns still saw the dollar signs and a need for troop garrisons. On the other hand, the government was faced with the end result of millions of dollars expended to improve the surviving post-Civil War forts. Quarters were needed for its army, and in the post-war climate, few new division-sized posts could be built. In the early 1920s, due to a need to provide adequate housing for military units, line troops were returned to the Northern Plains in sizable numbers. The 17th Infantry was posted to Forts Crook and Omaha. Fourth Infantry Battalions were sent to Forts Lincoln and Missoula, where they remained for the next 20 years. The 4th Cavalry Regiment returned to Fort Meade in 1924 and stayed there till 1942. And in addition to its remount operations, Fort Robinson became an artillery post when the 4th Field Artillery was stationed there from 1928 to 1931. Although the artillery years pro proved a somewhat noisy departure from Robinson's formal pastoral setting, important field, testers were, uh, field tests were conducted on new ordnance, on variations of the Browning automatic rifle and the Thompson submachine gun. Once again, Senator Warren's Fort Russell was the big winner with the largest post-war garrisons. Between the wars, it served as home for the 13th and the 15th Cavalry Regiments, the 76th Field Artillery, and the 4th Infantry Brigade. The good senator died in 1929, and in 1930, the name of the fort was changed to Fort Francis E. Warren. Diversions from regular Army routine and training came in the period between the wars. Beginning in the early 1920s, citizen military training camps were organized and held to prepare young men for military service. Annual summer training sessions were held at Forts Crook, Lincoln, and Warren, where detached officers and enlisted men served as training advisors for the student soldiers. Also, Reserve Officers Training Corps and National Guard training sessions were conducted at Fort Russell during summer months. The biggest diversion came during the Depression with the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1933. Because of the Army's experience in dealing with large numbers of men, it was placed in charge of the new program. Within seven weeks of inception, 310,000 young men were put to conservation work, all organized, housed, and supplied by the United States Army. The last northern forts played a key role in the success of an important relief effort. In our region, Forts Crook, Lincoln, and Missoula served as regional CCC headquarters. Individual companies were stationed at Meade and Robinson for conservation and post-improvement work. By 1939, seven out of the 66 established Army posts on the Northern Plains were still active. Three in Nebraska, one each in South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. Five of the troop, or posts still housed regular line troops as they did in the 19th century. Troops still marched, trained, and performed the regular routine of the old Army until the winds of war 
again swept the northern plains. The Second World War brought a great change to the old surviving army posts. After the national emergency was declared in 1939, most of the regulars quickly left. The 4th Infantry from Fort Lincoln in 1939, Fort Missoula in 1940, the 17th Infantry departed Fort Crook in 1940 also. And in 1942, the brigade at Fort Warren moved out. At Fort Meade, the fighting 4th Cavalry was brought up to full strength, and then in April 1942, its horse section was dismounted at Fort Robinson in an emotional scene for the old troopers. It was a changing world, and the days of the old horse cavalry was over. Like old career soldiers, the last army post awaited new roles, most of which were a vast departure from their original military uh, uh, duties. War brought new residents to the old forts. 1941, the Immigration and Naturalization Service established internment camps to house civilian and Italian seamen that were stranded in American ports, including the Panama Canal, when war was declared. The isolated inland location of some of the now empty posts seemed ideal, to, uh, ideal for their confinement. At Fort Missoula, which is pictured here, 1,200 Axis sailors and Japanese uh, nationals were incarcerated. Fort Lincoln was also used to inter a like number of prisoners. Both forts continued in this role uh, through much of the war, and in 1944, Fort Missoula became an Army medium security uh, disciplinary barracks for court-martialed soldiers. Victory in North Africa brought nearly 200,000 German and Italian prisoners of war to the United States. Scores of prisoner of war camps sprang up across the country. One of the primary locations for PW camps was at military posts where the army or uh, where the government already had land. Besides active operation as the United States largest remount depot, a camp was housed at Fort Robinson early in 1943. By December of 1944, 3,000 German war prisoners were housed there. Smaller numbers of Italian and German soldiers were also kept at Forts Crook, Meade, Omaha, and at Fort Warren. After the 4th Cavalry left Fort Meade, airborne soldiers of the 88th Glider Infantry moved in. Although there was never a landing field at Meade, the glider troops performed ground forces training. In August of 1943, they participated in the Battle of Fort Robinson, a large-scale maneuver, training maneuver, involving parachute and glider regiments from Alliance Air Force Base that was held in the hills west of the post. With the departure of the 88th Infantry later in 1943, the last combat units of the United States Army to be stationed on the Northern Plains were gone. Even though the regular troops had left, new uses came for the old forts, where the Army still had the land and facilities to aid in the war effort. After its troops left, Fort Crook became an induction center, a 7th Corps supply depot, and also a major aircraft production center. Interesting. Back in 1920, an Army airfield named Offutt Field was built at Fort Crook. Subsequently, in 1941, the government built a huge bomber plant that adjoined the north side of the post parade ground. Over 1,500 Martin B-26 bombers were built there. In 1944, the Martin plant switched over to B-29 production the plant eventually built 13% of the Super Fortress bombers used in World War II, including the Enola Gay. Robinson was also busy. After the cavalry was dismounted, thousands of horses, as high as 12,000 horses, were maintained there until declared surplus and sold. Although the horses were out, mules were in. <coughs> 
The Robinson Depot processed and issued thousands of pack mules to the Army. About at the same time, a War Dog Reception and Training Center was established through which passed over 14,000 dogs. Sentry, guard, messenger, sled, and scout dogs were trained at what became the largest dog training operation in the United States military history. This is quite a change from the days when Robinson was a cavalry regimental post. Once again, Fort Warren was the big winner. In 1941, the post became the main quartermaster replacement center for the 7th Corps, uh, Corps area. In addition to processing and training quartermaster personnel, an officer candidate school was established there. South of the main post area, and you can see the old permanent uh, brick buildings in the background of the old post, a cantonment area of nearly 400 buildings that housed 20,000 trainees was built. While Fort Warren prospered, Fort Meade declined. Its active military days over, Meade followed Forts Harrison and McKenzie, and in 1944 became a Veterans Administration hospital. That year, several hundred German prisoners of war were transferred from Fort Robinson to the Fort Meade camp to help with the conversion process. Although a major war in which a massive military force was created to serve during the emergency was over, peacetime has always brought a drastic reduction to military forces, and the end of World War II was no exception. Across the United States, the need for hundreds and hundreds of military installations had ended, including those on the northern plains. Reduction for the majority of army posts and bases meant abandonment, but for a few others could also mean realignment. Fort Smead, Missoula, and Lincoln never went back into service as, a regular, as regular army stations. Fort Robinson was also in its last days as an army post. Peacetime brought an end to all of its military functions. By 1946, the German prisoners were all shipped home. The war dog program was done, and there was no longer a need to prepare and ship mules to the China-Burma theater. With the cavalry dismounted, the Army transferred its remount program and depots, including Fort Robinson, to the United States Department of Agriculture. The transfer ended 40 or 74 years of military service as beef cattle replaced the fine horses once stabled there. Old Fort Omaha had fared well through the hard times of the 1930s and the World War II period. With the departure of its regular infantry garrison in the late 20s, it became a residential post for officers assigned to the 7th Corps area headquarters in downtown Omaha. Peacetime brought an end to its army days, but not yet its military use. In 1946, Fort Omaha was transferred to the Navy, and it became the Continental Headquarters for the U.S. Naval Reserve. Blue uniforms returned to the post, which is now referred to as a base. In 1974, the Navy left Fort Omaha ending over 100 years as a military installation. Today, the site is the campus of the Metropolitan Community College. The college has done a fine job in preserving and marking the remaining Army buildings that still, sur uh, still surround a tree-lined parade ground. Two of the last Army posts on the Northern Plains were never abandoned as military installations, but transferred to another service branch. In 1947, the United States Air Force was created, and certain old Army posts became Air Force bases. At Cheyenne, Fort Warren officially became Francis E. Warren Air Force Base in 1949. During the Cold War, Warren was a uh, strategic air command missile base and commanded Atlas, Titan, and Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles. Today, the, the former fort controls 150 Minutemen III silos in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. And what you can say about Warren Air Force Base 
is that although uh, it's an air base that does not have any runways, today there are still 20 brick stables in a row there. Fort Crook also went to the Air Force. With its central location, Crook, renamed Offutt Air Force Base, became headquarters for the Strategic Air Command, and in recent years, the Strategic Command, or STRATCOM. What was the last Army post built in Nebraska became the most powerful military installation in the world. So that's the story of the last northern forts. The reality was that in times of peace or war, the army or the, or the fort was the binding post point between the citizen soldier or private citizens and citizen soldiers. After abandonment, the fort site became a tangible remnant of the story of military men that served and went on. To better appreciate the story of people serving through three major wars, we need to know something about the places they were stationed, the posts of the army. And in a few instances, they are today an active touchstone connecting our generation with those that passed before and a heritage of American military history. Thank you. <laughs> but I've always uh, uh, been interested in forts since a, a, uh, a young lad. And uh, at that time, uh, on TV, there was, of course, the king of the, uh, the frontier, Davy Crockett. And uh, one gets in his mind the impression of what a fort should look like, you know, with the nice palisade walls and stuff. And uh, I remember when living in South Dakota, we were promised a visit to Fort Pier. Uh, not realizing the fact that Fort Pier had actually entirely disappeared about uh, 75 years before my first visit. Uh, upon getting there, seeing an open field with a granite marker in the center was a good introduction to what many historic sites look like. Uh, but it is really interesting to travel around the country and to see uh, the, these old posts that still remain. You know, and, and uh, uh, after a while, uh, for instance, when they got into the standard design buildings, you know, in about the 1890s, uh, you can go to an army fort and, and just immediately appear there and you know exactly what buildings were. Because from Fort Robinson, you know what they were there? When you get to these other places and the exact buildings were used, see. Uh, fort uh, Riley is a little bit different, however. They have the exact buildings, but you get in Kansas and what do you got down there? You got rocks. <laughs> You got stone, and so their buildings at Riley are made out of out of uh, limestone, but their their size and the configuration is exactly the same as the brick that we were using here on uh, on uh, the northern plains. So, um, uh, it's, like I said, it's very very interesting to go around and, and see these different installations. Uh, one time I had a tour of uh, Fort uh, Warren, which of course was a strategic air command installation, which is uh, you don't just drive up and say, hey, I want to drive around a little bit. You know, that doesn't work. Uh, but I knew a colonel, and that was the last place he was stationed before retirement, and then he remained in Cheyenne. And uh, so he very graciously took me over onto the base. Now, the interesting thing was on that same day, they were dedicating the new uh, base exchange commissary complex, which was built just south of the main brick post where that temporary cantonment was. And guess who was there? George Sr. It's when he was president, you know. And so consequently, everybody in the world was on the, that part of the post. And here we had the, you know, there was the only people that were on the old post area, of course, which we, which I was very interested in seeing, was about under every third tree, there was an air policeman. So uh, we had a very enjoyable afternoon driving around looking at this, this big, massive expanse that Senator Warren uh, did create. Uh, does anybody have a question? Where does Fort uh, Hartsup fit into this? Stuff? Fort Hartsup was a, uh, a single company post that was one of these protected posts that was built in the 1870s. Uh, 
And, and at that particular time, where, where uh, Nance County is, that entire county was the Pawnee Reservation. And see, the, the Loop Rivers run down, you know, from the Sand Hills down. And it, it, it became kind of a general route for the, for the, uh, uh, the uh, Brulees and uh, Oglalas when they uh, wanted to go down and raid the Pawnees. They were just going right down those rivers, right down to the reservation. And there were some settlers at that time that were moving up the Loop Rivers. And so what they did in 1874, they established an army post there, see, to protect the settlers in that area, and then also kind of control the, uh, the, the Sioux traffic heading down to visit the Pawnees. Um, and interesting enough about that, uh, it, it, it's in the valley, and, and they have a lot of gravel, and so they made uh, their buildings out of grout, you know, concrete grout. And uh, at that time, there was a lot of suffering because of the grasshoppers. You know, we had a lot of grasshoppers the year before and stuff. So it, it actually ended up as sort of a, a relief project where the local people, see, could get work working for the Army building this fort. And that's why so much of the post is there is because it's concrete rather than, you know, wood or adobe. And it was used until 1881. And then, of course, that was the end of its military career. Anybody else? Dorothy? It's my aunt, I gotta pick on you. <laughs> Where was Fort Meade uh, near what city? Uh, Fort Meade was at Sturgis in South Dakota. Um, as early as 1855, it was recommended to build an army post uh, near the Black Hills. And so this finally takes place after uh, the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn. They build a, a Fort Meade. Uh, and that's a really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting place to visit because uh, it's a VA hospital today, but the, the hospital is built right next to it. And so uh, the officers row and almost all of the barracks and support buildings are still there. See, and Fort Meade is kind of interesting because it was the first place in uh, United States military history where they were uh, playing uh, the Star Spangled Banner, you know, when the flag comes down. See, so it's just a very, very interesting, nice uh, uh, installation to take a look at. Uh, also, it's one of the few army posts that they did not move uh, the post cemetery. You know, usually when they would abandon an army post, they would, they would move the burials to a national cemetery, see, so they'd have the perpetual care. So like if you go to Fort McPherson uh, down by Maxwell, in that cemetery, there's uh, people there from Fort Laramie, Fort Sydney, Fort Robinson. Uh, a lot of the burials were moved to uh, Fort Leavenworth, and a lot of the men were uh, reburied at Custer Battlefield. But they did not move Fort Meade Cemetery. And today, it is a national cemetery. You know, and it's closed. The only people that are there are the military personnel. So it's very, very interesting to look at these markers, and sometimes they would, you know, have the uh, uh, reasons of death, you know, things like that. Uh, so it's just a, a, a neat historic site, you know, and you can just, it's just a mile, a mile and a half uh, right straight east of uh, Sturgis. I might not recommend going up there in about mid-August, so it's, it's a little, traffic's a little rough up in there. Um, anybody else? Uh, what was Fort Niobrara by uh, Valentine used for? Fort Niobrara, what had happened was uh, uh, we have the, the uh, Great Sioux Reservation, which was the entire western half of South, of South Dakota. And uh, the Army did not want to build military posts on reservations. And so what they wanted to do, however, was sort of to surround the reservation with posts. And so Fort Niobrara was built in 1880 to guard the Rosebud part of the reservation where the Brulees were. And then see Fort Robinson guards the western part. Uh, we've got Fort Meade in South Dakota, you know, and places up in Wyoming and stuff. So they pretty well... Uh, you know, the, the soldiers weren't like right on top of the Indian people, but they're real close. And see, about the beauty of the railroad and why the forts that were built on railroads, why they survived um, outside of having a sugar daddy like uh, Senator Warren, was the idea of transportation. See, um, and the railroad changed the, the, uh, the western frontier very, very, very dramatically, you know. Uh, in 1866, there was a company of the 8th Infantry that was being transferred uh, from St. Louis to go down and serve in southwestern Arizona. And in 1866, it took that company 
three months to get from point A to point B. Okay? In 1886, that same company was transferred from Arizona to Fort Robinson. Four days. Four days. See? So the railroad posts then become the survivors, you know, that they keep keep using, although the, the original purpose, you know, of course, is long gone. Uh, we had in, in, in Utah, uh, uh, Fort Douglas in Utah had just in the 1990s is when it was abandoned, see? So it had been used as a troop station where we keep line troops like infantry, cavalry, built in 1862 and made it all the way up until the 1990s. So there's some of these old places around that are pretty, um, you know. Anybody else? Oops. Outpost different from a fort, or one and the same? Well, uh, uh, an outpost can usually mean sort of a smaller place where you've got some troops, you know. Uh, a post is where you put soldiers. See, a units were posted at a place. And um, <clears throat> you have a military post can either, and this is where the, it gets a little strange, but uh, a military post can be a fort, can be a camp, and can be a barracks. See? So the difference is, is that temporary uh, army posts were designated as camps or barracks. It's where men see, are sort of kind of temporarily held. And if you have where you're going to like, well, we're going to keep people here a few years, then it's a fort. So if you have, you can foresee a temporary need to place troops at a point, then you have a camp, see. And uh, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, they decide, well, anything that's going to be permanent, we'll make it a fort, right? Okay, uh, in the, the mid-19, uh, the later 1970s, we had uh, designations on a number of places changed. You know, so here we had these forts that were built in World War II, uh, then finally became forts. Like Camp Carson, Colorado becomes Fort Carson, you know. And uh, see, then they, after, you know, 40 years, well, I guess it's kind of permanent, so <laughs> we'll, call it, we'll call it a fort. But then it gets a little weird because we end up with places like, see, we had a large military post in San Francisco, and what was it called? The Presidio. See, it was never called Fort Presidio. It was just the Presidio, Presidio at San Francisco. Uh, we had a large fortification on the East Coast that was called not Fort Monroe, but originally Fortress Monroe. See, so you have this sort of a little departure from the norm on some of that stuff. See, and in 1874, because they needed to keep a military presence in the area, that's when Camp Robinson is redesignated re as Fort Robinson. See. Anybody else? Down near Hastings, was there no fort there? No, well, no, no. Those were uh, uh, those were built for that specific purpose. Um, in in World War II, we had uh, a large uh, army ammunition plant at Meade and also at uh, Grand Island. And uh, the great thing is, is that uh, like if you make a bomb. Well, the first thing you do is you put it on a train and you get it out of there. And so they would have ordnance depots where they would have, you know, the, the bunk, the igloos constructed, and they would store the ordnance there. And usually you want to have that in sort of an out-of-the-way place. So they built uh, the uh, uh, they, a Sioux Ordnance Depot at Sydney. And at the same time, they built the Black Hills Ordnance Depot at Edgemont, South Dakota. So see, what they're doing is they're holding the munitions until you know, it's sent overseas to be used. However, uh, Hastings was a naval uh, 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 plant. You know, they're making stuff there, but they're also storing stuff there. But it was a huge, you know, big, huge area. And when I read one time, it was about like 40% of what we fired at the Japanese made in Hastings. So, you know, like the battleships and them 16-inch shells made in Hastings. And it was actually a... Naval installation, like an almost like a base, you know, 
And so they have all this naval te terminology involved with its history and, you know, sailors running around and, you know, your guards are Marines, you know, and that type of stuff. Okay, well, I want to thank you for coming and have a nice rest of the day.